People are usually scared of the unknown, and one of the biggest unknowns that humanity has still not explored to the fullest is the ocean. The ocean harbors a variety of primordial life that can kill anyone easily, but few strike fears into the hearts of humans as sharks do. Sharks are one of the oldest predators in the world's oceans. They have remained unchanged, perfect, and as hungry as ever. The ferocity of a provoked shark is a force of nature on its own, something that Emma Ferguson would find in her deadly encounter with an annoyed bull shark at her local aquarium. Story 1 Emma Ferguson, a college student studying engineering in Columbus, Ohio, intended to switch schools once her pre-engineering program was up. She had always wanted to be a marine biologist, but some personal issues held her back from that dream, so she took up the next best degree, according to her parents' wisdom, engineering. Although she enjoyed the courses and had no issues passing her finals, she didn't feel fulfilled from the experience. She was not the most popular girl, but she had a close-knit friend group that preferred to spend their time indoors playing Dungeons & Dragons or video games. One of her friends, Marco, worked in a zoo near their city and would often bring his friends in after hours to enjoy the animals without concern for other people being a bother. One day, Marco invited Emma and another friend, May, to visit the zoo late at night because they were installing two new exhibits in the aquarium a shark tank, and a seal enclosure. Emma and May jumped at the opportunity as it seemed exciting, so they met Marco at the zoo the following night. Arriving at the zoo, Emma and May found it creepy since no people were around, but Marco was comforting. Men were working on the enclosures with the animals still in them, so they elected to walk around the zoo until the work was done. They visited various enclosures but were disappointed that their favorite animals were sleeping. However, nocturnal animals were a sight as they roamed freely around their enclosures. After about an hour of walking around the zoo, the trio returned to the newest exhibit and marveled at the size of the shark tank and how cute the seals were. These animals were understandably stressed from transport and seemed to be on edge, but the group didn't register this as they were still in awe. The girls walked up to the seals and admired them and their fat little bodies while Marco took a special interest in the sharks. As the girls looked at the seals, Marco climbed up the small platform to the top of the shark tank, which had a flimsy plastic lid to keep it shut, likely to make feeding easier for the keepers. Marco was a keeper, but he had been on the job for only a few months and usually kept to the reptile enclosures. He snapped open the lid in one section of the tank and stared into it. When May called him out on this stupid decision, he told them to climb up with him and check it out. May refused outright, but Emma was curious and climbed the platform despite her friend's warnings. When she reached the top, she was amazed at the sharks and how gracefully they were gliding through the water below them. They whispered among themselves about how elegant they looked and seemed so close. Emma, seemingly entranced, slowly reached out for the water to feel its temperature. It felt cold, shockingly so. She dug deeper into the tank as the sharks congregated at the bottom. There were three of them in total, three massive bull sharks. She turned her gaze toward Marco with tears in her eyes. She told him she regretted not pursuing her dream of studying marine life as originally intended. She said the moment the two of them shared could have been her day-to-day -day life, but she was stuck doing something she hated. Marco hugged her and said things always turned out well but they didn't consider that one of the sharks was getting much closer to the top of the tank. The two turned back to look at the tank, and Emma pulled her still hand back. The sudden movement caused the shark to flex in the water and surge towards Emma's arm. It was too fast. Emma screamed as the shark clamped down its strong jaws on the middle of her forearm, pulling her to the floor above the tank. Marco held her up and didn't let the shark's weight pull her into the tank only making her scream worse. Sharks usually let go of their prey after the first bite, but these sharks were stressed and hungry, so it only held on to her out of desperation for a meal. It pulled harder and harder until Emma felt the most shocking and burning pain she had ever felt in her life. Degloved. 
The skin from her forearm gave way and followed the shark's teeth into the cold water. Emma shrieked as her arm burned, but passed out from all the pain. Marco pulled her back from the tank, panting and throwing up at the sight of the mangled tendons and blood still dripping from her skinless arm. He told May to call an ambulance right after Emma got bit, so they were on their way. He gripped the part of her arm that still had skin with all his might to staunch the bleeding while May ripped up her hoodie to apply a tourniquet to her arm. They succeeded and the blood stopped flowing, but Emma was still not responding to them. They could hear paramedics running through the zoo hallways to get to them since they were in an urban area and the ambulance's response time was remarkably short. This speed ended up being the only reason Emma survived the incident as she started to go into shock. They carried her off to the vehicle and left Marco and May on the ground in their urgency. May slapped Marco for letting her do something stupid, but Marco broke down in sobs. They sat there for 30 minutes, unsure of what to do. Ultimately, they went to the hospital to see their friend, but it took a week for her to stabilize enough to talk to anyone. She pulled through the incident, with her doctors claiming she would have to get grafts to mend the damaged skin. However, the psychological scars never healed, and Emma developed an irrational fear of fish and large animals, which crippled her desire to be a marine biologist. Marco lost his job and decided to quit college due to the depression that set in after he blamed himself for Emma's incident. Even though Emma forgave him for what happened, they cut ties and moved on with their lives. Best friends Eli and Ayla were on a trip to Hawaii for their summer vacation. Their favorite hobby together was going to beaches and snorkeling, since the two have developed a passion for seeing aquatic animals and documenting them every single time. This time, they decided to fly to Hawaii and visit the beautiful beaches of Oahu, where they could go snorkeling with vast coral reefs and different fish species. However, they wanted to try something new, free diving with sharks. Some beaches in Oahu offer shark diving in a cage, but one particular beach offers shark diving without using a cell, but rather going free diving or snorkeling along with the sharks. Ayla initially hesitated, but Eli encouraged her to challenge herself and face her fears. As they arrived at the beach in Oahu, they were greeted by the friendly locals and staff surrounding the place. Not only that, they were welcomed by the beautiful view of crystal clear waters and white sand beaches making them even more excited for their awaiting adventure underneath the waters. They also met a local freediving instructor named Calais, who would be their guide when they went freediving the next day. Eli and Ayla headed to their hotel first to rest, as Calais accommodated them and told them to call him when they needed help. The two couldn't contain their excitement as they couldn't sleep, knowing that tomorrow they'll be having one of the wildest aquatic adventures they could ever experience. When the next day came, Eli and Ayla were picked up by Calais from their hotel to the beach. Calais will accompany them on their freediving adventure and tell them everything they need to know when swimming with sharks. Calais also said that the number one rule was not to panic, since sharks can sense panic and fear. After the mini orientation with Calais, Eli and Ayla grabbed their gear as Calais took them to their freediving spot using a small boat. When they reached the area, they immediately went under the water. They were welcomed by the mesmerizing sight of the deep blue sea surrounding them. Additionally, Calais warned them that sharks might approach them at any time, so they should keep swimming in case that happens. Ayla became nervous as Eli held her hand when he noticed his friend. He gave a thumbs up sign to Ayla to cheer her up. Ayla smiled at him and went on with their free diving. Calais, who was in front of them to serve as their guide, turned around and gave them a thumbs up as he could see a shark approaching them at a distance. Eli swam over to Ayla and tapped her back to cheer her up. The shark was fast approaching and Eli was excited. However, Ayla couldn't stop worrying about what kind of shark was coming at them right at that moment. Calais, who was having difficulty identifying what type of shark it was, was shocked when it was right in front of them. And turns out, it was a tiger shark, which was unexpected. 
Ayla became terrified of how big the tiger shark looked. Kalei immediately went over to calm her down and told her to stay still since the shark was circling them. Eli was relaxed as he knew that Kalei was with them, but little did he know that Kalei was also nervous since it was not common for him to swim with the tiger shark. Everything was going fine until the shark decided to swim underneath Ayla, which caused her to panic and kick the shark. The tiger shark was not pleased and felt threatened, causing it to bite Ayla's left leg. Kale and Eli were shocked as the tiger shark continued to bite Ayla's leg, shaking her body through the water and trying to rip her leg off. Ayla was screaming underwater as Kale headed over to the shark to kick it with his bare feet, while Eli held Ayla's body and tried to hold it to calm her down. The tiger shark kept biting Ayla's leg, and Kale used all his strength to kick and punch its face and gills. When the right moment came, Kale poked the shark's eye which caused it to flinch and swim away from them as fast as possible. After the attack, they immediately helped carry Ayla out of the water and into the small boat to get help. As they reached the shore, Ayla fell unconscious. She was then taken to a hospital to get medical attention for the bite wound on her left leg. She survived the attack, but had to spend a long time in the hospital to recover from the injury that the shark caused. The sun was setting on a warm July evening in 2015, as six teenagers made their way down to the secluded bay on the eastern coast of Florida. The subjects of this group that found themselves amid blood and teeth are Eric and Kenneth Lang, two brothers whose idea was to go on a trip across Florida. The group consisted of four boys and two girls in their late teens. They had been planning this trip for weeks, eager to explore the lesser-known beaches of the state. The teenagers had heard about the beautiful bay on the internet and were excited to check it out. However, they had been warned to stay away from the area due to a recent spike of shark sightings. But the group ignored the warnings, believing the sightings were exaggerated and it was safe. They chose to go to the bay in the very early hours of the morning to avoid getting told off by someone who took the warning seriously. As they waded into the still cold waters of the bay, they talked among themselves and joked about their memories of the trip up to that point. Although cold, the water was quite enjoyable, so the group had no worries. Eric and Kenneth were talking about their parents' concern about considering going on that trip when Eric yelped in pain and surprise. His brother asked him what the matter was, and he pulled his leg up to the surface to reveal it was roughed up as if someone had dragged sandpaper across it. They didn't understand what could have done it, but the pain wasn't too bad. They decided to swim in more shallow water, so they started back. As they were swimming, Kenneth noticed a dark shape underneath them. Nervous, he told his brother to swim faster as they approached the group. As he said that, he saw a large dorsal fin cut through the water and dip down again, only to feel a violent blow to his stomach. The wind was knocked out of him and he fought to take a breath of air, but it came along with some salt water, causing him to stop swimming. Eric looked back and at that moment felt the worst pain of his life as the tiger shark assaulting them clamped onto his cap with tremendous force. He screamed, alerting the rest of the group to the situation. They froze in place and didn't know what to do. One started swimming toward them, only to be dragged back by the other boy. The girls fled the scene, it was later revealed that they ran to the town to call for help, while the two remaining boys stood and watched the scene unfold. Eric flailed in the water and tried to kick the shark away with his free leg, but it was not intending to let go anytime soon. Kenneth acted on sheer adrenaline and instinct, diving into the water to get the shark off his brother. He tried pulling it off, but it didn't work, so he grabbed its head and started kneeing it in the snout. It let go after that point. The shark darted towards the group, its jaws wide open. One of the boys, Alex, tried to swim away, but was quickly pulled underwater by the massive predator. The other teenagers screamed as they watched in horror as the shark thrashed its massive body in the water. The girls in the group arrived back at the scene with a fisherman in tow. 
He understood the area well and intended to help the boys as best he could while the ambulance arrived. The fisherman was taking some harpoons to be sharpened and maintained when the girls ran up to him screaming and crying, so he immediately came to their aid. With one harpoon in his hand, he jumped into the water and swam toward the boys, calling them to swim toward him. They did so, but not without their share of discomfort. Eric could feel his bones grinding against each other with each kick in the water, and Kenneth was barely breathing because of swallowing so much water before. They met at the halfway point, and the fisherman grabbed hold of Eric and started swimming back to shore with both of the boys. At that moment, the shark returned, choosing Kenneth to rip its next morsel off. He was dragged under the water and thrashed around by the shark, only to be released after a few moments. He rushed to swim back to the surface, but the shark was eager for more meat and bit into his upper thigh harder than before. He let out all of the air in his lungs in an attempt to scream, and he could feel his consciousness fading fast. The last thing he saw before he breathed air in again was the flash of the fisherman's harpoon passing his head and jamming itself straight into the shark's snout. The fisherman let Eric swim back to shore on his own to help Kenneth, and just in time at that. Kenneth remembered feeling the pain in his thigh ease up a bit and the feeling of running water as he was dragged back to the surface by the man. Both of them resurfaced and took massive breaths of air, much to Kenneth's relief. Eric was lying on the beach in tremendous pain, but he never kept his eyes off where the fisherman dove to find his brother. He could hear the ambulance in the distance and knew everything depended on them returning to shore. Should they succeed, the nightmare would be over. Kenneth could feel himself slowly regaining consciousness, but was still dizzy because of the blood loss. They kicked through the water as much as they could, eventually reaching the point where they could stand up and walk back to shore. As soon as he stood, Kenneth collapsed, and the fisherman hoisted him up on his shoulder. He carried the young boy back to his brother and laid him beside him. The sound of the ambulance was getting louder and louder, so all they could do was wait. The vehicle eventually arrived and they loaded the teenagers into it, tending to their wounds on the way there. As they left their sight, the fishermen scorned the rest of the group for not heeding the official warnings and acting like idiots. He didn't let them leave and insisted on calling their parents to update them on the situation. They protested but understood their lives were in question, so they gave in. Eric and Kenneth's parents immediately rushed to the bay to see their sons, but the drive was over an hour away. When they got to the hospital, their mother demanded to see her sons. She was updated on their situation and was informed that Eric would likely be okay, but Kenneth had suffered brain damage due to blood loss and lack of oxygen. He was stable but unresponsive. After waiting a few days, the doctors informed the family that both boys would pull through although Kenneth's motor functions and speech would be irreparably distorted. The boys continued their lives as best as they could, and their parents never reprimanded them for their irresponsible decision to swim in that bay. They were just happy their sons were alive. Mixes blood, bones, and the natural beauty of the Floridian waterways into a nightmare for Adam Dougal a 26-year-old American software developer who booked a trip that would change his life forever. In July 2010, Adam was working in his office when he felt immense pressure in his chest, followed by an overwhelming sense of panic. He started hyperventilating, and a bystander rushed to help him. After 20 minutes of sheer panic, Adam finally calmed down and was called to HR for a conversation. He spoke to a representative, and they both agreed that the work he was doing had been taking a toll on him, so they offered him a vacation to take a break from work and recuperate, as they didn't want him having panic attacks for something that can be managed outside the workplace. He left earlier that day and was given two weeks of paid leave, which he appreciated. He had to finance his vacation with his own money, but that was not an issue, as he had been living alone then. Within the week, he had booked a trip to Ponce Inlet, Volusia County, Florida, for some much-needed relaxation. Adam had been living in Wisconsin then, so warm weather was welcome. 
Right after his flight, Adam visited the nearby beach cafes on his first day to have a pint. He met some locals and they praised the beauty of their beach and welcomed him for his trip. One offered to give him a lift to his motel, which he accepted, and he was ready for the rest of his stay. The first few days were spent enjoying the sights of Ponce Inlet, and he even took a day trip to Orlando to meet up with some online friends, and they had dinner. The next day, Adam left his motel around 9 a.m. to get to the beach before everyone else and snag a decent spot in the shade. He arrived at the beach and enjoyed a few hours of lounging around and reading a book before he picked up his snorkeling gear and went into the water for a swim. From a young age, he had always loved snorkeling and enjoyed looking for shells as deep as he could dive. During his swim, Adam noticed the array of colors at the bottom of the bay where he was and resolved to dive down and look for any oddities that might cross his path. As he got deeper, the water got colder and he could feel the pressure in his ears building, but he pressed on. Diving deeper into the murk, Adam was amazed by the complexity of flora and fauna. He swam through the kelp, collecting small shells that caught his attention. He noticed his breath was running out after about a minute under the water, so he resolved to return to the surface. As he turned upwards, his attention was caught by something opaque moving in front of him. It was a jellyfish. Adam did not know much about jellyfish, but he knew to avoid them, so he swam around them and rushed as his breath was running out. About nine feet from the surface, he looked behind himself only to see a dark shape dart from his vision and further behind him. But he couldn't tell what it was. Panic started to set in, but he couldn't focus because of a tremendous searing pain in his left shoulder. He rapidly spun around as his vision was clouded by a red mist, his blood gushing as a juvenile bull shark held onto him and thrashed, ripping the muscle away and tearing tendons to shreds. He released the rest of his breath he had in his lungs and flailed his left arm to get the thing to let go of him, and it did after just a moment. His lungs burned because of the lack of oxygen, but he knew he had to keep kicking despite the pain. He neared the surface as he felt his consciousness shuddering, but he was close. His head breached the water, and he took a huge breath, clearing his mind and letting him focus on the pain in his shoulder. Just as he started to swim back to the shore, some ten yards away, the wind was knocked out of him by a coarse, hard blow to the stomach. Sharks are opportunistic hunters, and they tend to attack their prey in surges, either biting their prey or bumping into it, hoping to disorient it and make the kill easier. Aside from the shock, Adam was not swayed and continued kicking to the shore and back to safety. He used only one arm for swimming, but he did manage to reach his destination. He screamed as he stood up and started running toward other people watching the scene unfold. They didn't understand what was happening and no people were in the water with him. Two bystanders rushed in to help him, taking him to a nearby clinic where his wounds were tended to. He spent the day in the clinic sizing his wounds and letting the doctors assess the damage. They determined that his arm would be functional but would never feel the same. He spent the rest of his vacation wrapped up in bandages, wearing a sling to keep his arm in place, and went home on a normal flight. Despite the stress of the situation, Adam's anxiety vastly improved as he realized that the mundaneness of normal life would never be as concerning as a life and death situation. Paige is a young surfer getting ready to compete in her first surfing event the next day. She had been surfing for years with the help of her professional surfer dad, Cohen. Paige and Cohen had been surfing on a beach in Perth, Australia every week and since then, their father and daughter bond has been closer than before. They often spend their weekends surfing the beach, and even during vacations, they still surf together. Cohen was glad Paige had developed a passion for surfing as much as he did when he was young. Now the two were training together at the beach as Paige would be competing the next day in her first surfing event. She's grown so nervous, but with the help of Cohen, she found the strength to compete against other surfers. She has prepared so much for this event, 
This is why she's also confident she will win. The following day, Cohen accompanied Paige to the surfing event, which was also held at the same beach where they would often go surfing. Paige sees this as an advantage, as she's used to the sea at that particular beach, boosting her confidence even more. As soon as they arrived at the event, Cohen was greeted by the staff and some authorities there. Paige realized her dad was a famous surfer in his prime, which was amazing for her. Almost every person at the event knew who her dad was, which made her nervous. She doesn't want to fail this event and disappoint her dad. When Paige saw other surfers practicing for the event, she also decided to practice and ride some waves just like the other surfers were doing. Cohen lets her do her thing, letting Paige surf with the others. Paige grabbed her surfboard and started to paddle to the water. Cohen watched as she began to surf and ride the waves going against her way. Cohen noticed his daughter's movement as the staff and authorities who knew him also praised Paige for being skilled like him at such a young age. The other people who came to watch the event also noticed Paige's surfing skills and praised her. They were all looking at Paige riding against the waves like a professional. Cohen and the others were focusing on the surfers, especially Paige, when suddenly Paige fell off the surfboard and into the water. The people gasped, thinking a big wave just threw her off. Cohen watched closely as he expected his daughter to swim and return to her surfboard, but she never did. Suddenly, everyone was alarmed when they saw Paige's arms surface in the water, waving them as a sign she needed help. It turns out that Paige was bitten by a young tiger shark in the leg and was now getting a hold of her body in the water. The shark was underwater when a strong wave hit her and jumped at her without anyone noticing. Paige began to kick the shark with her other leg, but it didn't let go. Paige screamed for help as the other surfers who were surfing with her became afraid and rushed to the shore immediately without daring to help her. Cohen grew worried and ran to the water without hesitation, swimming to save his daughter. Two lifeguards also went into a motorized inflatable dinghy to help rescue Paige from the shark. Meanwhile, Paige could feel the shark's teeth against her skin, and blood was already visible in the water when she realized it. She cried out once more for help as she saw Cohen swimming and the two lifeguards on the dinghy coming to save her. Cohen arrived at her first as he kicked and punched the tiger shark's face with his bare hands. Paige held on to him as he kicked the shark's face with all his strength, trying to ward off the shark. He hits the shark's face repeatedly with his feet until the shark gives up and lets go of Paige's leg, leaving her bloody severely. The two lifeguards riding on a dinghy finally arrived and helped Cohen and Paige climb up in the boat before taking them back to the shore. The people at the event were horrified when they saw Paige's severely bitten leg. Cohen tried his best not to cry at his daughter's situation, as the authorities decided to take her to the hospital for treatment and cancel the event to prevent further incidents. Paige miraculously survived the attack, but it would take a long time for her leg to heal before she could go surfing again. Today's story takes us to the warm beaches of New Smyrna Beach, Florida. Known for its amazing waves, beautiful blue waters, and breathtaking scenery, the beach draws beachgoers and tourists from all over the world to tan, surf, or just hang out at the beach and have a good time. Jet skis, hoverboards, and other small boats pepper the waters along the shore giving it a very charming and amusing appeal to everyone who would come by. But as much as it's a great place to hang out, it comes with its own downsides. The downsides come with rows and rows of sharp, dagger-like teeth and a bite force that could shear a surfboard in half, a creature that lurks in the depths and is a true apex predator. At New Smyrna, they had been declared as the most common creatures to attack. The great white shark, weighing in at over a thousand kilograms and with a body shaped like a torpedo. These creatures have evolved to own the oceans, feeding on whatever they see fit. However, they mainly prefer seafood, but sometimes when humans get a little too close for comfort, things can get a little messy 
or deadly. Jacqueline, Sarah, Tom, and Brad had taken a small yacht and headed out to the waters off the shore. They had decided to spend two nights out on the water, just off the beach, while they had their fun. They were couples and had decided that a double date on a small yacht out by the sea would be a wonderful idea. Jacqueline had warned them about the sharks, but they seemed to play it down. Come on, Jackie, said Brad. There hasn't been a shark attack here in like a year. There's still a chance, Jacqueline replied. Can we just try something else? You should really stop being a baby, Jackie, said Tom, her boyfriend. This is going to be fine. I'm with you, okay? After much goading, she had agreed to head out with them, and soon she had forgotten about all of her worries concerning the sharks. She jumped into the sea with her friends, splashing around and having the time of their lives. The first night passed without incident, and after they were done swimming, they got back in the boat and had their dinner. Some of the leftovers from the steak which they had was thrown overboard into the sea. In all of their fun, they felt safe, not aware of what lurked below. Sharks are able to detect even the slightest vibrations in the waters with the use of their lateral lines, a sensory nerve which runs across their entire body, allowing them to sense vibrations several miles away. A lone female shark hunting some fish picked up on the vibrations caused by Jacqueline and her friends. The hunter turned and headed in their direction, looking to investigate the source of the sound. The shark sensed the sound could come from an injured seal, a delicacy to great whites. An injured one could most likely be free food on the platter, and so the creature bolted through the waters, rushing towards their boat at breakneck speeds looking to catch a good meal. And while Jacqueline and her friends slept, the creature closed in on them. The next morning, they took their time, making out in the small bedrooms assigned to each couple. It wasn't much of a bedroom, just two mattresses on opposite sides of the boat. Afterward, they got out and began celebrating by drinking wine and dancing on the deck of the yacht. Jacqueline danced wildly, deciding not to have as much alcohol as everyone else. As they danced, Brad began turning the boat as they were looking to head back to the beach once they were done for the day. Hey man, any more of that steak left over? Brad asked as he lined up the boat. Yeah, Tom replied, a fair amount. Can I have it? Tom laughed and yelled, yeah bro, catch. Brad turned to see Tom hurl a bit of meat towards the sea. Reacting quickly, he jumped to his feet and launched himself over the side of the boat and into the water, stretching so he could catch the piece of meat. He barely missed it, landing in the water with a huge splash before reaching back up. Damn it! Almost got it, said Brad. Yeah, right, Tom turned to the girls. Anyone who can catch a piece of steak in their mouths gets 500 bucks. As many as you can catch, keep it going. The game began, and Tom hurled piece after piece out to the water. They jumped after it, trying to catch it, but to no avail. The pieces of meat hit the water and began to spread, and the nearby shark picked up on the scent with its sharp nose. The creature was drawn to the ruckus. It swam closer, following a piece of steak which it saw floating to the bottom. She closed in on it. The great white parted his jaws and ate the meat. Woo! Jacqueline yelled as she caught her piece of steak, munching happily as she opened her mouth to show everyone else. I got it! You got it, Tom asked in disbelief. She swam back to the boat and got aboard, opening her palm for her promised reward. He handed it to her, only for her to push him overboard. Game still on! She turned back and grabbed some of the leftover meat before turning back to her friends. She looked around and raised an eyebrow. Where's Sarah? Brad turned around and realized that the woman who he had heard behind him a second ago was gone. He laughed nervously for a second before putting his head underwater to see if she was purposely hiding from them, looking to play a prank on him. As he put his head down, he spotted something swimming fast underwater. It moved in a straight line at first, 
before it angled upwards and came right at him. Brad realized that he was face to face with a shark, and it had opened its mouth wide, swimming right up to him. His scream was muffled by the water as his head was under the surface, and a second later, his head was gone, and the rest of his body was catapulted upwards by the speed of the shark. Tom and Jacqueline watched for a second as the body stabilized and began filling the water with blood, and they realized that his head was gone. Tom began swimming for the boat frantically as Jacqueline screamed loudly, paralyzed with fear. Tom reached the boat and grabbed onto the side of it. Just as he did, Jacqueline spotted the fin of the shark break through the water, rushing right for them. Before Tom could lift himself out, the creature sank its jaws into his thigh, locking in and pulling, its sharp dagger-like teeth cutting through the flesh, ripping it down to the bone. Tom screamed and held onto the boat for dear life. A shark dragged him, and with his hands gripping the boat, she pulled it along as well, propelling them towards the beach. Jacqueline screamed, reaching out to Tom to offer him a hand, but as she looked into his eyes, she saw a look that terrorized her. He was petrified. The shark stopped pulling, and the sudden stop caused the boat to jerk forward, knocking into the side of Tom's skull, knocking him out instantly, and sending Jacqueline overboard. She fell in and began swimming away, seeing as the boat had continued moving due to the momentum it had. She frantically swam for shore, seeing it wasn't too far away. She screamed, calling out for help as she eventually reached the shore and got the attention of other locals. She made it out alive, but not much was left of the others. The moral of the story is, when the stakes are high, a great white will win. Coastal waters in the summer are the go-to locations for tourists and divers to go and enjoy themselves, be it on vacation or on a day-to-day -day basis. However, not all vacation destinations are entirely safe, as you have a variety of sea creatures that can kill you with one touch, take entire limbs, and leave you scarred for life. We have three of the most terrifying accounts of everyday people coming across sharks of all species out in the wild, and none have a good outcome. The first story we'll talk about Max Enfield, a 14-year-old diver who found himself face to face with the greatest terror of the sea, the Great White Shark. Story 1 It was a warm summer day in Cape Town, South Africa and 14-year-old diver Max Enfield was eagerly getting ready to explore the depths of False Bay. Max was introduced to scuba diving by his father, Marcin, when he was 10 years old, so he was not short on experience in the water. His father always accompanied him as it was their way of bonding and having fun in their free time. The day that Max's diving career would come to a screeching halt was June 11, 2005 when he would find himself in the ocean's depths with one of the most dangerous predators imaginable, a great white shark. His and his father's day was going quite well, with Max being free from school and his father's job easing up on the workload, giving him more free time. They decided to head for the beach around 11 a.m. and explore some marine life like they always did. They had a tradition of looking for unique shells or anything interesting. Whoever found the best shell wouldn't have to cook dinner when they returned. Max rarely won, but it was the experience that made it worthwhile. As the pair neared their usual meeting point, they spotted a group of novice scuba divers preparing for their first class. They seemed friendly, so Max's father asked them if they could join the class and provide insight into how to get the most out of diving. The nervous novice divers visibly became more comfortable and the two instructors were happy to take them up on their offer. They made their acquaintance and helped them load the gear onto the boat. The mood was pleasant and the pair enjoyed spending time with fellow divers. They would take a boat to Seal Island to see some unique wildlife. There were seven people, including Max and his father, and things seemed to be going quite well. Max and Marcin dove into the water first to demonstrate to the group what they have to do and then they went off to explore while the instructors conducted their lesson. 
The pair was experienced, true, but they didn't need to all be there to help the newbies. As the pair enjoyed sights like these every week, but it never got old, and each dive was just as amazing as the first. Max looked around, determined to find something impressive to show his father. As his gaze moved along the ocean floor, he spotted something shining at the bottom and thought it would be his best find ever. He pointed to the bottom to Marcine, just so he knew where he would be, to which his father gave him a thumbs up. As Max got deeper and deeper into the water, he felt it getting colder, but he was determined to reach his goal. Through the kelp, he spied the object and reached it after a few minutes. The shine the object was letting off gave him the certainty that he would finally beat his father in their scavenger hunt game. He thrust his hand into the mud and sand and pulled out his prize. It was a piece of glass, a useless piece of glass. He sighed internally and flipped himself over to float in his disappointment. When he opened his eyes again, he was met with a sight that would haunt him forever. The sight of a giant great white shark's maw getting closer and closer to him. He flipped back around in his panic, but the shark was far too fast. Its jaws clamped around his shoulder and the oxygen tank on his back, bursting it. The respirator was blown out of his mouth, and he let out a scream, but it was lost in the water around him. The pain was horrible, worse than anything Max had ever felt. He thought of escaping that situation, but the pain inhibited his thoughts. All he could do was wriggle and try to fight off the shark. Just as he was starting to lose consciousness, he saw something surge in front of him, only to see the determined face of his father, who saw what was going on and rushed to Max's rescue. He quickly thrust his hand into the shark's gills to get it to let go of his son, and thankfully it worked. Knowing that time was of the essence, Marcin grabbed Max and started kicking to the surface with everything he had. His legs were burning with the effort, but nothing else mattered except ensuring his son was safe. They left a trail of blood in their wake as they ascended. After about a minute, they breached the surface and both screamed for help, much to the horror of the other instructors explaining the equipment to the new divers. Deathly pale, they hauled Max into the boat and set him down on the deck, with Marcin following closely. He pushed the two men aside and knelt behind Max, who was bleeding. The bleeding was profuse, and Max felt weaker with each passing second. Marcin told the instructors to turn the boat on and rush them to the nearest town, which they immediately did. Marcin put pressure on Max's wounds and used the boat's first aid kit to bandage him as much as possible. They eventually got to shore, and Marcin didn't want to wait for an ambulance, so he picked up his son and started running toward the nearby clinic he knew of. After admitting Max to the clinic, he sat in the waiting room with bated breath and never moved his eyes from the door. Eventually, a doctor came out and told him he had arrived just in time. Any more blood loss, and Max wouldn't have made it. He was extremely thankful for that and made sure to stay at his son's side until he felt well enough to go home, and he remained at his side for the entirety of his recovery period. Max recovered after a few months, but never recovered emotionally from the ordeal, leading to him dropping diving entirely. Max and Marcin instead took up biking through the countryside as a hobby. Even though that hobby was nothing compared to their love of the sea, the pair agreed that their safety was much more important and that Marcin could not force Max to do something he did not want. The last story for today's video tells of three young adults named Noah, Abby, and Lily. They went cage diving and encountered a furious bull shark. Noah, Abby, and Lily were three friends enjoying their summer vacation trip on an island. It was their fourth day and they all wanted to try exciting things together to make the most of their journey there. Noah suggested they should all go cage diving with sharks, to which his two best friends instantly agreed. The next day, they all inquired at the resort that they were in to go cage diving. The resort staff assisted them and led them to a boat with a scuba diving expert named Danny and another mate named Troy to help them with their cage diving. They all boarded the boat and sailed to a designated section of the sea 
where they would swim alongside the sharks. Troy provided Noah, Abby, and Lily oxygen tanks and helped them gear up for cage diving. They all secured their scuba gear first and gave instructions. Noah was thrilled to do the activity, while Abby and Lily were nervous. Danny said the cage was too strong for a shark to break into, which immediately calmed them down. When everyone was ready, the three young adults entered the cage and were gradually lowered. The three of them were impressed by the beauty of the fish, coral reefs, and ocean depths as soon as they got in the water. Noah brought his GoPro camera to take footage of their cage diving. Everything was going so well, but the three of them suddenly became bored because the sharks were still not showing up. What comes next after a couple of minutes will forever terrify the three. As unexpected as they thought, a furious bull shark suddenly charged into their cage at a fast speed, causing the cage to shake in the process. Noah dropped his GoPro and was about to reach for it outside the cage when the bull shark charged again and attempted to bite his hand. Luckily, he managed to dodge the sudden attack, yet ended up having a generous cut that released blood into the water, attracting the shark even more. Abby and Lily were now freaking out as the angry shark kept charging and pounding its body to break the cage. When Danny and Troy realized the three were in danger, they immediately operated the boat. Abby and Lily sobbed as they lifted the cage to reveal Noah's hand had been severely injured. They swore to themselves never to go cage diving again. The sun was setting on a warm July evening in 2015, as six teenagers made their way down to the secluded bay on the eastern coast of Florida. The subjects of this group that found themselves amid blood and teeth are Eric and Kenneth Lang, two brothers whose idea was to go on a trip across Florida. The group consisted of four boys and two girls in their late teens. They had been planning this trip for weeks, eager to explore the lesser-known beaches of the state. The teenagers had heard about the beautiful bay on the internet and were excited to check it out. However, they had been warned to stay away from the area due to a recent spike of shark sightings. But the group ignored the warnings, believing the sightings were exaggerated and it was safe. They chose to go to the bay in the very early hours of the morning to avoid getting told off by someone who took the warning seriously. As they waded into the still cold waters of the bay, they talked among themselves and joked about their memories of the trip up to that point. Although cold, the water was quite enjoyable, so the group had no worries. Eric and Kenneth were talking about their parents' concern about considering going on that trip when Eric yelped in pain and surprise. His brother asked him what the matter was, and he pulled his leg up to the surface to reveal it was roughed up as if someone had dragged sandpaper across it. They didn't understand what could have done it, but the pain wasn't too bad. They decided to swim in more shallow water, so they started back. As they were swimming, Kenneth noticed a dark shape underneath them. Nervous, he told his brother to swim faster as they approached the group. As he said that, he saw a large dorsal fin cut through the water and dip down again, only to feel a violent blow to his stomach. The wind was knocked out of him and he fought to take a breath of air, but it came along with some salt water, causing him to stop swimming. Eric looked back and at that moment felt the worst pain of his life as the tiger shark assaulting them clamped onto his calf with tremendous force. He screamed, alerting the rest of the group to the situation. They froze in place and didn't know what to do. One started swimming toward them, only to be dragged back by the other boy. The girls fled the scene. It was later revealed that they ran to the town to call for help, while the two remaining boys stood and watched the scene unfold. Eric flailed in the water and tried to kick the shark away with his free leg, but it was not intending to let go anytime soon. Kenneth acted on sheer adrenaline and instinct, diving into the water to get the shark off his brother. He tried pulling it off, but it didn't work, so he grabbed its head and started kneeing it in the snout. It let go after that point. The shark darted towards the group, its jaws wide open. One of the boys, Alex, tried to swim away, 
but was quickly pulled underwater by the massive predator. The other teenagers screamed as they watched in horror as the shark thrashed its massive body in the water. The girls in the group arrived back at the scene with a fisherman in tow. He understood the area well and intended to help the boys as best he could while the ambulance arrived. The fisherman was taking some harpoons to be sharpened and maintained when the girls ran up to him screaming and crying, so he immediately came to their aid. With one harpoon in his hand, he jumped into the water and swam toward the boys, calling them to swim toward him. They did so, but not without their share of discomfort. Eric could feel his bones grinding against each other with each kick in the water, and Kenneth was barely breathing because of swallowing so much water before. They met at the halfway point, and the fisherman grabbed hold of Eric and started swimming back to shore with both of the boys. At that moment, the shark returned, choosing Kenneth to rip its next morsel off. He was dragged under the water and thrashed around by the shark, only to be released after a few moments. He rushed to swim back to the surface, but the shark was eager for more meat and bit into his upper thigh harder than before. He let out all of the air in his lungs in an attempt to scream, and he could feel his consciousness fading fast. The last thing he saw before he breathed air in again was the flash of the fisherman's harpoon passing his head and jamming itself straight into the shark's snout. The fisherman let Eric swim back to shore on his own to help Kenneth, and just in time at that. Kenneth remembered feeling the pain in his thigh ease up a bit and the feeling of running water as he was dragged back to the surface by the man. Both of them resurfaced and took massive breaths of air, much to Kenneth's relief. Eric was lying on the beach in tremendous pain, but he never kept his eyes off where the fisherman dove to find his brother. He could hear the ambulance in the distance and knew everything depended on them returning to shore. Should they succeed, the nightmare would be over. Kenneth could feel himself slowly regaining consciousness, but was still dizzy because of the blood loss. They kicked through the water as much as they could, eventually reaching the point where they could stand up and walk back to shore. As soon as he stood, Kenneth collapsed, and the fisherman hoisted him up on his shoulder. He carried the young boy back to his brother and laid him beside him. The sound of the ambulance was getting louder and louder, so all they could do was wait. The vehicle eventually arrived and they loaded the teenagers into it, tending to their wounds on the way there. As they left their sight, the fishermen scorned the rest of the group for not heeding the official warnings and acting like idiots. He didn't let them leave and insisted on calling their parents to update them on the situation. They protested but understood their lives were in question, so they gave in. Eric and Kenneth's parents immediately rushed to the bay to see their sons, but the drive was over an hour away. When they got to the hospital, their mother demanded to see her sons. She was updated on their situation and was informed that Eric would likely be okay, but Kenneth had suffered brain damage due to blood loss and lack of oxygen. He was stable but unresponsive. After waiting a few days, the doctors informed the family that both boys would pull through although Kenneth's motor functions and speech would be irreparably distorted. The boys continued their lives as best as they could, and their parents never reprimanded them for their irresponsible decision to swim in that bay. They were just happy their sons were alive. Bentley had always loved the ocean. He grew up in Florida, and as a child he spent all of his free time playing in the waves. When he was old enough, he became a lifeguard and began patrolling the beaches he had grown up on. He loved his job, the feeling of saving lives, and the ocean even more. While on duty, Bentley noticed a commotion in the water one day. A man was struggling to stay afloat and yelling for help. Without hesitation, Bentley ran towards the water and dove in. The water was rough that day, and Bentley struggled to reach the man, but he refused to give up. He fought through the waves and eventually reached the man who was now unconscious. Bentley quickly got the man to shore and began performing CPR. He was so focused on saving the man's life that he didn't notice the shadow lurking in the water behind him. Suddenly, he felt a sharp pain in his leg and everything went black briefly. When Bentley woke up, he was in a hospital bed. His leg was bandaged and he was hooked up to machines. 
He could hear the sound of the ocean outside his window, but he felt a deep fear that he had never felt before. He knew something terrible had happened, but he couldn't remember what. The nurse came into his room and explained what had happened, making him fall unconscious. While he was performing CPR, a shark attacked him. It had bitten his leg and dragged him under the water. Bentley tried to fight it off by kicking the shark's face with his free leg, but it was useless. The shark clung onto his leg like a piece of meat and dragged him to the water. There, he was shaken and thrashed around like a toy, causing him to feel dizzy and weak for a short period. Bentley kept screaming for help, and although he thought he was strong enough to survive, he never thought he could lose all hope in just a split second. He closed his eyes until he heard somebody scream his name. Another lifeguard, Jason, had seen what had happened and had jumped in to save him. Together, they fought off the shark by punching and kicking his face, nose, and gills and returned to shore. There, Bentley fell unconscious due to the severity of the attack and was rushed to the hospital for immediate medical attention. Bentley was shocked. He had always known that sharks were dangerous in the ocean, but he never thought it would happen to him. He couldn't believe that he had been attacked while doing his job. He felt like he had failed, like he should have been more careful. As he recovered in the hospital, Bentley thought about what had happened. He realized that he had been so focused on saving the man's life that he had forgotten to be aware of his surroundings. He had let his guard down, almost costing him his life. When he was discharged from the hospital, Bentley was determined to get back to work. He knew he couldn't let fear control him and refused to let the shark attack defeat him. He returned to the beach where it had happened and slowly walked into the water. It was terrifying, but he forced himself to stay calm and remember everything he had learned as a lifeguard. As he waded through the waves, Bentley felt his confidence growing. He knew he had been lucky to survive, but he also knew he was stronger than he had ever realized. He had faced his fear and came out the other side. Bentley returned to work as a lifeguard and was more careful than ever before. He made sure to always be aware of his surroundings and never let his guard down. But he also knew that accidents could happen and that he couldn't control everything. A few weeks after he returned to work, Bentley received a letter in the mail. It was from the man he had saved on the day of the shark attack. The man thanked him for saving his life and said he was grateful daily for Bentley's bravery. Reading the letter brought tears to Bentley's eyes. He realized that even though he had been through a traumatic experience, he had also done something incredibly important. He had saved a life, and that was what being a lifeguard was all about. On April 5, 1992, in a coastal town known for its tranquil charm, an unexpected incident shook the community to its core. John Miller, a middle-aged man with a taste for adventure, was in a dangerous situation after accidentally falling from a canoe and getting attacked by a large tiger shark. John left his motel in the early morning hours and headed to the docks to meet up with an old fishing buddy and have a conversation about some real estate the pair were planning on buying. They sat down in a cafe and discussed business matters when his friend Albert suggested they could paddle out to a nearby cay where they could sit down on the beach and relax. It was a nice day and John accepted, not knowing what would ensue because of that decision. They found a man renting canoes for as many hours as needed, so they rented two out for five hours, considering the time it took them to reach the quay and back and the time they would spend there. Before long, they were on the water and happily paddling to the quay, about a mile away from the docks. Around the halfway point, John and Albert were talking about their families when John's canoe suddenly flipped its front end back, throwing John into the water with a mighty splash. Albert called out to him as he floated up to the surface, asking what in the world had just happened. As he tread water, he tried to reach out to his canoe to get back inside when he yelped and threw his head back in surprise, telling Albert that something had brushed against the back of his legs, something rough like sandpaper. Understanding that they were not alone there, John rushed to get back inside the canoe and managed to do so most of the way. He was almost inside 
but as he tried to haul his right leg into its compartment, he was horrified as a pair of massive jaws came crashing through the surface and biting into his leg. He roared as the pain shocked his body, and he was forcefully pulled back into the cold water. Albert was very close to John and tried to grab onto his life jacket, but to no avail. Adrenaline coursed through John's veins as he realized his dire predicament. With his heart pounding, he fought against the relentless shark, which showed no signs of letting go soon. It thrashed around, ripping through John's muscles and tendons like ribbons. After a moment had passed and John had drunk his share of seawater, the beast finally let go and swam away, getting ready for a second attack. Seizing the opportunity, John flailed his arms upward, making a mad dash to the surface, where Albert was waiting with a helping hand. He hauled his friend up as far as he could and relied on him to help get himself inside the canoe with him. John was groaning with each movement, and Albert spotted a dark shape under the water, getting closer and closer to the canoe. Thinking quickly, he waited for the shark to break the surface again and slammed his paddle directly onto its snout, making it slink back into the water with just enough time for John to pull all his limbs inside the vessel. His leg was torn to shreds, and Albert knew that time was of the essence, so he started turning them around to get them back to the docks, as there was no clinic on the quay. Through miraculous luck on their side, there was a small boat with an engine going in their direction as they realized what was happening and rushed over to help. The two men and the woman on the boat helped pull John in, taking care not to make his wounds bleed more than they had to. They quickly found some old gauze in the first aid kit and covered his leg with it and some bandages to hold everything together. He was deathly pale but still responsive, which was the most important. They reached the shore and John was admitted to the local hospital where he was stabilized and remained for a week, with Albert and his family visiting him frequently. He made a full recovery after a few months of therapy. This next haunting attack occurred in Florida, more specifically off the coast of the Florida Keys, where a fisherman named Alfred Moore found himself the prey of a massive great white shark, bigger than he had ever seen. Alfred had been a fisherman for 15 years and was well-versed in commercial and hobbyist fishing. He spent most of his time on the Keys, but he also did some tours of other American shores and more exotic places such as Africa and Thailand. Fishing was always a part of his life, and this encounter would send his life on a downward spiral, impossible to come back from. Alfred woke up in the morning of July 2, 1999, and decided that the weather looked fantastic for fishing. He had rarely caught mahi-mahi and decided that that day would be the day. After saying goodbye to his wife, he left his house and went to the beach where his boat was docked. On the way to the docks, Alfred met one of his fishing friends, Adam, who asked if he could tag along for the day. Alfred said he needed to clear his head and wanted to fish alone. Adam accepted. Later, Alfred reminded himself that things might have turned out much differently if he had accepted his friend's suggestion. It was a two-man boat, but Alfred handled it just fine on his own. He loaded up his equipment and set sail, sailing for approximately 20 minutes before he arrived at his destination. He heard that Mahi Mahi often congregated around that point and stopped his boat. Although fishing usually took a long time, he enjoyed his own company and the company of a few cold beers in his cooler. He set up his gear and fishing poles, letting two hang off the boat to lure in the fish. As the day dragged on and the beer in his cooler was reduced to just a couple of cans, by all accounts, he was inebriated. The day was going according to plan. He managed to snag a few mahi-mahis and was very happy about it, but he wanted to catch a few more fish for his freezer when both lines tightened simultaneously. He reeled each one in bit by bit, slowly pulling the fish to the surface and tiring them out. It took about five minutes, but it was no issue for Alfred. He had done this a hundred times before. 
However, things started to go wrong when Alfred realized the line on the right suddenly tightened and pulling in became much easier. As it got to the surface, Alfred saw that it was another mahi-mahi, but it was only half of the fish. It was easily 30 pounds, and something bit it in half without effort. He realized something dangerous was in the water, and it was time to pack up, so he moved forward and pulled the right line into the boat, then drew his attention to the leftmost line. It was caught under the boat, so he had to cut the line. As he bent down to cut the line where it met the water's surface, he saw a dark shape immediately underneath him for a split second before his vision was obstructed by a massive splash of water followed by the worst searing pain he had ever felt in his life. He looked in front of himself, eyes still stinging from the salt water as he barely held on to the edge of the boat, and there it was, a great white shark latched onto his arm. He screamed in pain and protest, but the beast disappeared as soon as it appeared, taking with it a bloody trophy. Alfred fell back into the boat as the blood from his arms sprayed everywhere, staining the white lining of the boat grotesquely. He hit his head on one of the walls, but managed to retain his consciousness. As he looked at the bloody stump the shark left over for him, all of the pain came rushing back, and he screamed again. He had to think quickly, so he took a bunch of spare fishing lines and messily sprawled it around his arm, whimpering as he did so. He pulled it tight with his teeth, as tight as it would go. While the bleeding did not stop completely, he had slowed it down enough to shakily get up on his feet and start the boat's engine up again. Each passing second was agony as the salt of the water stung his wound and his eyes but he had to focus on getting back to shore and medical assistance. Against all odds, he did not pass out from the blood loss or the pain and managed to endure the 20 plus minutes it took to get back to shore. As he did, he saw that there weren't that many people on the beach, or at least not near the docks where he usually left his boat. He switched the ignition off and clambered to the dock. He could feel his vision blurry, but he had to find someone at the edge of the dock, he could see a small cafe he would visit sometimes and focused all his energy on getting there. The last thing he remembered was the feeling of wind on his face as he fell to the cold tiled floor of the cafe. A day later, Alfred woke up in a hospital bed to the presence of his wife and their daughter, who rushed over to his side from another city nearby. They hugged him gently and told him that one of the employees in the cafe called an ambulance that took him to the hospital. He thanked them for being by his side all that time, but the blood left his face again when he remembered that the shark had taken most of his forearm, leaving him debilitated and unable to fish as he used to. It took him a few weeks to get used to the absence of his arm, but that didn't stop him from embracing this change as an opportunity and opening a fishing shop where he taught both the basics of fishing and what to be careful about. The shark was never seen there again.